Good afternoon. Welcome to the Lord's house this day. It's good to be back. Certainly enjoyed our vacation in the last couple of weeks, but it's also very good to be home and be back home here at St. John's. A few announcements for you. Uh, first of all, uh, please remember that next week we're going to have a service time change on account of the picnic. So instead, on Sunday morning, so instead of meeting uh, together at 8.30, we'll be meeting together at 10 o'clock next week. Speaking of which, please stick around for the picnic. It's always a great time. And then finally, we do have a need for some assistance. There are various sign-ups out in the narthex. There's some food items that still need to be picked up and as well as some volunteer uh, sorts of things that still need to be done. So please uh, take a look at the lists out of the narthex and sign up to help make our picnic a success. Today in our sermon, we're going to be taking up our Old Testament lesson and we're going to be doing so under the theme of freedom from fear. We'll continue then with our hymn of invocation number 913. Rise for confession and absolution on page 203. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. 
Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand, for with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as His people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue with the entrance hymn, number 785, the first stanza. praise you, O God, our Redeemer, Creator, in grateful devotion our tribute we bring. We lay it before you, we kneel and adore you. We bless your holy name, glad praises we sing. We can see with the Kyrie on page 204. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. To God on high be glory, and peace to all the earth. Goodwill from God in heaven, proclaimed at Jesus' birth. We praise and bless you, Father, your holy name we sing. Our thanks for your great glory, Lord God, our heavenly King. To you, O soul begotten, the Father's Son, we pray. O Lamb of God, our Savior, you take our sins away. Have mercy on us, Jesus. Receive our heartfelt cry. Where you in power are seated at God's right hand on high. For you alone are holy, you only are the Lord. Forever and forever be worshipped and adored. You with the Holy Spirit, alone our Lord most high, in the Father's glory, amen, our glad reply. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love the receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no other God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is the 119th psalm. It can be found in the very beginning of the hymnals. Psalm 119, and we'll speak it by half verse from verse 57. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. But the cords of the wicked ensnare me. I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your just and righteous decrees. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle is from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom, the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Alleluia. 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 These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. The servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? 
How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them, that both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day number 772. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God said, Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it, and you are my witnesses? Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. 
I know not any. Fear not, nor be afraid. And that's our theme for today. Freedom from fear. Now fear is one of the most pervasive and powerful forces in the world. A recent study of 2,000 people found that the vast majority of people were afraid of something. It found that 49% of Americans were afraid of sinf- uh, civil unrest. 51% were afraid of high medical bills. 52% were afraid of government corruption. 60% We're afraid of mass shootings. And 65% were afraid of loved ones dying. And fear is on the rise. Study after study after study has shown that anxiety, in other words, fear so strong that it can be clinically diagnosed, has been on the rise over the last 20 years. Anxiety is future-focused. It's not a fear of something sitting right in front of you like a spider. But it's fear of what might be around the corner. What might be coming. And a sad twist is the young, those that have the most amount of future ahead of them, that have experienced the highest increases in anxiety. Fear, it's a powerful force. We don't need statistics to show us this. We can see this in our own lives. Fear is what keeps us from asking that cute girl out on a date. Fear is what keeps us from applying to that dream school or dream job. Fear is what keeps us from speaking up. If this weren't bad enough, people seek to exploit our fears so that they can gain power and money. Politicians, well, they're famous for appealing to our fears. Same old story, same as it ever was. And those statistics about what people fear that I quoted at the very beginning, guess where I found them? On a website selling home security systems. Fear can bless us when it keeps us from doing things that might harm us. So fear is good when it keeps us from petting rattlesnakes and running out into traffic. But fear is a terrible foundation for our lives. It ultimately leads us to harm others. And the book of Isaiah makes this clear. It shows us how we can be free from fear. Now, I want to be clear about something here. When we talk about how God can give us freedom from fear. This isn't to the exclusion of certainly uh, good counseling or medications to help with clinical anxiety or something like this. Those certainly have their place. But it is certainly a blessing by means of the Gospel to have our hearts changed from hearts of fear to instead hearts of trust to have our minds trust in the Word of God rather than to be set on our own ways and to thus have a firm foundation. The rock. God. Someone upon whom we can trust rather than ourselves, which, as we're going to see in our sermon, it's when we trust in ourselves rather than God that true fear rises up in us. So, let's, let's take a look at our, our Old Testament lesson for today. And God, in a sense, commands the Israelites to the prophet Isaiah not to be afraid. And why should they not be afraid? They should not be afraid because they have this special relationship with God. A God who in turn has been faithful to them. Now, God indicates His faithfulness to them and His exclusivity with these words. He says, you know, Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Now, when God uses this word rock, it's a, it's a very 
laden word. It's a word which is evocative of God's special calling and faithfulness to the Israelites throughout generation upon generation. We're going to explore this imagery a little bit later in our sermon. But he appeals not only to his faithfulness to them and his constancy towards them, but also to the special relationship that they have with him. He says, you are my witnesses. They have had this special relationship with God throughout the generations, and therefore it is this relationship with God, a God who can be trusted, which can provide them freedom from fear and provides not only the Israelites freedom from fear, but us as well. And we're going to talk about this. But then, and this goes beyond our Old Testament lesson for today, God contrasts this relationship of His faithfulness to them and their faith in Him, which can be the foundation of freedom from fear, he, he contrasts that in turn with idolatry, which arises out of fear, but in a weird twist is also a cause of fearful conditions and a cause of fear. So we're going to take a look at uh, the rest of chapter 44 here, or the next section of chapter 44. Now, you have your Bibles with you. I certainly op- uh, encourage you to open up your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, uh, now is your opportunity to play on your phone during the sermon without getting a weird look from your pastor. So you can pull out your phone and pull up your Bible app. Hopefully you all have a Bible app on your phone And follow along, we're going to take and and kind of scroll through chapter 44, verses 9 and following. So, the English Standard Version gives this heading for the next section, The Folly of Idolatry. And it has all kinds of images for why idolatry, in other words, worshiping anything that is not God, is foolishness. He says, all who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. And he goes on and gives this imagery with regards to the, the making or the shaping of an idol. So he goes on to say, verses 13 and following, The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. It becomes fuel for a man. He takes part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it, He makes into a god his idol and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. Now, right on the surface of it, there's there's multiple levels to this. Right on the surface of it, Isaiah wants us to see the foolishness of trusting in idols. I mean, how can... So, you know, he's talking, at least on the surface, about physical idols, you know, carven images of gods and goddesses. And he says, look, with part of this wood that you formed and fashioned an idol with, 
you burned it up and you warmed yourself and you baked bread over it and you roasted meat over it and then the other half of it, now you're bowing down over the other half of it and saying, deliver me? Putting your faith and your trust in this thing that you would have otherwise burned up? That makes no sense. That's no kind of foundation for your life. But there's, there's two things, as we look at this a little bit deeper, there's two things I want you to see about this. First of all, this, this forming of a prophet, or rather of, a, of an idol, is an act born out of fear. He prays to it, it says here in verse 17. He prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my God. What Isaiah is saying is, look, those who are making idols, this is an act of fear. They believe that there are are forces that are oppressive, that are dangerous to them, and that they need help in order to in order to face those forces and those those oppressive and, and dark things out there in the world. You know, the things that they might worry about then. A lot of, in a lot of ways, the same things that we worry about now. You know, there's disease now, there was disease then. There is civil unrest now, there is civil unrest then. There are corrupt governments now, there are corrupt government leaders then. And, and looking at all of these dark forces in the world, the idolater forms and fashions this idol out of an act of fear and says, deliver me to it. But here's the thing about this this idolatry. If we press this just a little bit deeper, what ultimately is that person putting his or her trust in? Himself. Herself. Who cut down that tree? Who marked the lines on it and measured it out? Who carved it? Who set it up in the corner of the home? The same person bowing down and praying to it. At its root, this idolatry was selfishness. At root, this idolatry was dependence upon the self. And when we depend upon ourselves and when we are selfishly oriented, oriented towards the self, well, this gives rise to all kinds of actions which in turn are causes of fear. Isaiah talks about how the the dissolution of Israelite society, which, which had its culmination and brought to its greatest extent in the invasion of the Babylonians, that this was brought about on account of idolatry. But you see, idolatry was this, in essence, worship of the self, worship of one's own works, worship of one's own deeds. This selfishness which caused individuals, for example, instead of treating their fellow Israelites like brothers, instead treated them as enemies. And how does this work out? real life, in the marketplaces, merchants would use false measures and sell corrupted goods because of the selfishness, this trust in themselves, which makes others into enemies, people not to be loved but instead to be exploited. 
And so people weren't receiving enough of the goods that they deserved, and they were receiving corrupted goods in turn. And this sort of thing is like a downward spiral. A race to the bottom. If you've been cheated in the marketplace, well then, for example, if you're a workman, maybe you will cheat the person who employs you. Instead of doing good work on a construction project, instead, you're going to cut corners. Use shoddy materials. Have bad worksmanship. You've been, you've been cheated in this way. You yourself might see that this is the way things go. So you conduct your affairs in the same manner. And in time, even households will turn against each other. It's idolatry. It's worship of the self. It created a society in which it was well-founded to have fear. Because just around the corner, you knew someone might be willing to cheat you, harm you, do wrong against you. And the cycle just feeds back on itself. Idolatry creates fearful circumstances. Fearful circumstances lead to more idolatry. And on and on it goes. Once again, the more things change, the more things stay the same. It's not common these days for people to bow down in front of images of gods and goddesses. But we're no less idolaters. We too are filled with unholy fear. Considering others not to be friends, not to be people to be loved, but instead as threats, people to be feared. And instead of trusting in the Lord, instead so often we trust in ourselves. God said to love your enemy, and to do good to those who hate you. Instead, far from doing this, instead, in our fear too often, we make even those who be the most natural recipients of our love. Our, our long friends, people in our households, we make them into enemies. But instead of following God's way of love, as shown in the Ten Commandments, we instead trust in ourselves. We follow our own ways. That is no less than idolatry. And that leads to fear. <laughs> but God offers freedom from fear. And the freedom from fear that He offered to the Israelites really is our freedom from fear as well. God uses this incredible image. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. As we go back into the Scriptures and see God's special relationship with His people, beginning with Abraham, we see that rocks, crags, have a special role in all of it. We can... Go back, for example, to this rock and the crevice in the rock that God placed Abraham to show himself to Abraham so that Abraham might trust him. We can think about this rock 
this mount upon which Isaac carried up, carried up the wood in order to be sacrificed on it, and where God redeemed Isaac by means of that ram. We didn't think about how God redeemed the people of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt and brought them to that rock, Sinai, where God made them His people by means of blood. The blood of the covenant tossed upon them there at Sinai. We can think about this great rock that the Lord brought them to. Mount Zion and Jerusalem. Where His holy temple was erected. Where God would be with them in His gracious presence. And so on it goes. By calling Himself their rock, God was bringing it to remembrance all the ways He had been faithful to them from of old. A faithfulness which in turn would inspire their faith in Him. As it was for them, so it is for us. All of those stories from the Old Testament, as His people, those are our stories as well, but the story goes on. We have two rocks which are the source of our hope. We have the rock of Mount Calvary, the place of the skull where Christ our Lord was crucified unto the forgiveness of our sins. And even as the people of Israel were confirmed as His people by means of the blood of the covenant at Mount Sinai, even more have we been made His people by means of the blood of that great sacrifice. Not the sacrifice of a lamb or a ram, but rather instead the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our sins having been forgiven, we therefore know that we have a special relationship with God. He as our Father and we as His children. We are people not only of the rock of Golgotha, but we are people as well of the rock of the tomb of Christ. The rock which stands empty testify to His resurrection. And so therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ, even as the eternal Son of God rose from the dead on the third day, we have the glad confidence that so too we will rise when Jesus returns in power and might and glory. And that, brothers and sisters in Christ, is the ultimate freedom from fear. The final statistic that uh, we read today was that 65% of Americans were afraid of either themselves or loved ones dying. That's the ultimate enemy which those who are worldly minded or idolaters cannot overcome. That's a future-oriented fear. But we know how the story ends. We know that in the time to come, there's not darkness but light. There's not suffering but rather gladness. There's not pain but rather comfort. We know But even as Christ overcame by means of the empty tomb, so also we will overcome. And so as we look into the future, brothers and sisters in Christ, we do not have cause for fear, but instead we have cause for confidence. We have now cause for anxiety, but instead we have cause for hope. 
Fear not, or be afraid. There is no God besides the true God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is no other rock, but instead, upon the rock of God and His faithfulness, we have a firm foundation and every reason for confidence and hope. And we, His people, are His witnesses. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise for the Nicene Creed on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things are made, who for us men and for our salvation come from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, and was made man, crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and sent him into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophet. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Holy Father, we praise and bless you that you have been faithful to us. We pray that in the knowledge of this, you would give us glad confidence and hope, freedom from fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King of kings and Lord of lords, you're the source of every blessing, including the blessing of good government. Therefore, we lift up to you, our president and governor, our courts and our legislatures, that through their work we may be enabled to lead lives of peace and quietness to your glory. We also especially pray for the armed forces of our land that you would keep them safe even as they keep us safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, before a word is on our tongue, you know it altogether. Therefore, we lift up to you all of those who have any kind of special need. So we pray to you on behalf of your servants, Jim Engelking, Bob Nugel, Bill Wilbert, and LaBella Depry. Give them all things needful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, whatever else you know that we need, grant us, O Lord, through your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please remain standing as the offering is brought forward. We continue with the service of the sacrament on page 208. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us in the centrally begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh, and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, 
evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes, the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment you condemn the sin of Adam and Eve, Wait the forbidden fruit, and you justly bar them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name, and as he has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O oh, Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, you take the sin of the world away. O oh, Jesus Christ, true Welcome to the table of the Lord, true body of Christ given for you. True blood of Christ shed for you, true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you, in body and soul, life everlasting, depart in peace. Welcome to the table of the Lord. The true body of Christ given for you. 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 True blood of Christ shed 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 for you. Christ shed for you. 
true blood of Christ shed for you. The true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting, depart in peace. Welcome to the table of the Lord. The true body of Christ given for you. 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 The true body of Christ given for you true body of Christ given for you the 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 true blood of Christ shed for you true blood of Christ shed for you. The 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 true blood of Christ shed for you. True body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul, to life everlasting, depart in peace. Welcome to the table of the Lord. True body of Christ given for you. True body of Christ given for you. True blood of Christ shed for you. True body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul, life everlasting, depart in peace. Anybody? Please rise from the minutes on page 211. O oh Lord, now let your servant depart in heavenly peace, for I have seen the glory of your redeeming grace. A light to lead the Gentiles unto your holy hill, the glory of your people, your 
chosen Israel. All glory to the Father, all glory to the Son, all glory to the Spirit, forever three in one. For as in the beginning is now shall ever be, God's triune name resounding through all eternity. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us to the salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you His peace. Amen. Our ascending hymn is number 705, stanzas 2 and 3. We worship you, God of our fathers. We bless you through trial and tempest. Our guide you have been. When perils overtake us, you will not forsake us. And with your help, O oh Lord, our struggles we win. With voices united, our praises we offer, and gladly our songs of thanksgiving we raise. With you, Lord, beside us, your strong arm will guide us to you, our great Redeemer, forever be praised. 